Welcome everyone. My name is Deborah Wang, Artistic Director of Design TO. Design TO is a nonprofit arts organization that is best known for its annual design festival. This year's festival takes place across Toronto, distanced and digitally from January 22nd to 31st, 2021. Design TO would like to acknowledge that the land we are on is the traditional territory of many nations including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It is now home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. As well, Design Teal would like to draw attention to Orange Shirt Day held annually on September 30th, today. This day recognizes the experiences of thousands of residential school survivors and acknowledges that thousands of indigenous children did not make it home. We recognize the devastating impact of these schools and ask that you consider supporting cultural revitalization initiatives, such as those offered by the Canadian Native Canadian Centre of Toronto. You can learn more at ncct.on.ca. Tonight's event, Accountable Space in Design, is a moderated dialogue on equity, accountability, and design. This panel is comprised of four exceptional designers whose work reflects a shared commitment to centering communities who have been traditionally marginalized or neglected. Together, they will engage the audience through a discussion about inclusive design, representation, ownership, and social practice. Additionally, this discussion will assist all of us in reckoning with how we are implicated in the historical and ongoing processes of colonialization, white supremacy, and displacement. We need to think critically about how these processes inform our relationship to the spaces we design and inhabit. Our moderator, Nicole Bernhardt, is an experienced facilitator, trainer, investigator, and mediator who has worked for over 15 years in the fields of equity, anti-racism, and human rights. Zara Ibrahim is a public interest designer and strategist, focusing on shifting power to people who are typically underrepresented in institutions and systems. Her work has focused on deep community-led approaches to policy, infrastructure, and service design. Nugote is a multidisciplinary creative, designer, and educator who works in audio, visual, and written mediums. He is the co-founder of the strategy and design studio Room for Magic, co-founder and creative director of partner publication Dean Journal, and an adjunct professor at Parsons School of Design. Shannon Holness consistently seeks to bridge and leverage the diverse skills that she has gained from years in customer service, front of line community work and facilitation to her career in urban planning. Yuta Trevanis is the director of the Inclusive Design Research Center and a professor at OCAD University. The Inclusive Design Research Center conducts proactive research and development in the inclusive design of emerging information and communication technology and practices. Thank you to Nicole for collaborating with us and to all of our panelists for your participation and insights. And also to the Design TO team, especially Robin Wilcox and Amanda Lau who are working behind the scenes tonight. The panel discussion will be recorded. It will run for one hour followed by a Q&A period. Audience questions can be submitted through the chat. Over to you, Nicole. Thank you so much, Deborah, and thank you for that introduction. So um, I, I think our whole panel is coming together, and I'm going to get us started off um, by asking our entire panel to speak to why it is that they're the ones who get invited uh, to panels on equity. And I, I want to acknowledge as someone who um, also gets 
invited to speak on equity and diversity, that this can be a very loaded subject matter. Um, Sarah Ahmed, feminist and anti-racist scholar, has said that there are a lot of perils and pitfalls to being marked as the diversity person or the equity person, especially for those of us who are already by virtue of our uh, race or other markers of identity are, are signified as different in spaces. And so I invite um, the panel to speak to that experience of speaking out on equity and inclusion and accountability and what that's been like for you. So uh, I'm going to ask Zara to, to start us off, uh, oh. followed by Shannon, um, then Yuta, and then New. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, and hi, everyone. We can't see you. We're just looking at each other, but I'm just imagining <laughs> this audience of glowing faces uh, on the other side of the vortex. Um, well, you're going to keep me keep me on time because I could go on about this for a long time. And I think not unlike our identities, um, our feelings about this kind of things can be fluid from context to context. In a context like this, I'm feeling pretty chill about being that person. I'm in the company of really brilliant folks who do the same work and we can have a more sophisticated conversation. Um, you know, I think that, you know, before, um, you know, I've been talking about equity since my, I began my career in design. And I think that there was a bunch of different reasons I got invited to speak and mostly because it was novel and weird that, you know, a non-registered architect was talking about reforming architecture and, uh, you know, a, a designer who didn't practice traditional design was talking about bringing equity to design. And I think for a lot of people, it was a really novel idea. It, you know, didn't hurt that I was a young woman of color uh, who was intellectually diverse yeah. in those contexts. And, um, you know, you hate to, we hate to acknowledge those things, but I think obviously that had some, um, you know, that, that played a role in some of the platforms I had access to. And at the time I leveraged those platforms. Uh, it was, you know, they were, they were being made available and uh, it felt like I had things to say. I mean, I think in the context of um, being that person who's always bringing it back to equity, I'm tired. I am so, and especially now, I think all of us probably agree is that it just feels like we've been screaming into the wind for, for me for 15 years. And now all of a sudden the winds died down and people can hear what, what myself and so many others are saying. And it's almost like, God, where were you 10 years ago? <laughs> um, and, and not to say I don't have energy for it, but I just think that um, I always got tagged as like the social purpose person. And I'm like, that doesn't feel right. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this tool that we're constantly bragging about that has the power to shift behavior. That's like what we always say, design is the power to shift mindsets and change behaviors and um, you know nudge. And yet we're not using it for the public good. We're not using it to collectively make this you know world more fair and just. So, um, yeah, I think I think my, you know, the experience has been fluid. And in this moment, I think folks are realizing that to care about equity is not to be that social social purpose person. It's to um, really feel the responsibility that we have in the kind of work that we all do. Thank you. And Shannon, how about you? Um, I think that people I think that um, the reason why I get invited to these types of things is because I've been able to um, I don't know what measure, like successfully um, translate, you know, advocacy concerns and causes um, into urban planning issues, um, and have that that line be made more and more clear um, over the course of my little career. Um, I just I just graduated from my master's program in 2018, and so it's only been a couple of years out of school, but I've been able to have a, a made an imprint on certain processes um, within the community benefit space, within the conversations of revitalizations in the city of Toronto and how they take place. Mm -hmm. um, specifically speaking about Toronto community housing, um, being a lifelong resident um, until my housing was condemned along with 132 others um, in my community and um, really challenging quest asking challenging questions around preservation history um, and then place and the right to place and um, how placemaking happens for communities like mine. I understand that a lot of communities that are predominantly black, the only way we really engage with an encounter space um, is through forced removal and displacement over and over again continually. And so how do we reconcile that with folks who do, you know, 
And once we leave those spaces, all we, all we have is the embodiment of that history. Um, and so there isn't really any negotiation in a place-based capacity to really support the legacies and um, contributions of Black, and in this context, African Canadian, um, African Caribbean and Black communities and um, in Canada and in Toronto particularly. So I think that being able to have those, those um, questions at the forefront of certain conversations is what kind of makes people want to know why, what I have to say about certain things, so. Thank you. And you, Ted. Yeah, I, I feel kind of old right now. And it's so lovely to um, have this panel here. I've been in this for 40 years. Um, and initially, it was very, very lonely. Uh, and and I was, I've been a pariah most of my career, um, someone that is avoided or uh, whose uh, message is somewhat denigrated, but it, it's certainly the tide is shifting, which is amazing. And as I said, it, this is my life's work. And I, I strongly believe that not achieving equity and inclusion for our human differences and variability it, it poses an existential threat. Um, the longer I work in this area, the more I'm also convinced that it's more profoundly important and much more difficult than is currently recognized. It's not a surface or a niche concern. It's not a trending issue or the social um, issue that you were talking about. It's not an issue of the moment. It's not something that can be fixed or solved or relegated to like a, a particular professional group or a special industry. Um, and uh, in my area, it's also not a checklist or a series of metrics that we can meet. It's, it's not even just a recalibration of power. I think what we're talking about requires a fundamental rethinking of how we do almost everything. Our notion of truth and knowledge, how we measure, assess value, how we plan, how we learn, our, even our democratic processes. Um, it's at the heart, I believe, of our survival. And especially now, during this crazy pandemic, we need to create systems that work for us when we're vulnerable, uh, that value our human differences and variability and can address complex complexity and change. So, uh, although, I, I mean, I'm, I'm tired. Um, and yes, it, it's been a long, um, a long journey, probably longer than some of you were have been alive <laughs> for me. But uh, I'm, I'm also pumped. I, I think that uh, th there is this tiny window of opportunity that we have right now when a lot of our systems are disrupted to, to really do something more significant and fundamental. Thank you so much. And new. Wow, wow to follow up. Um, so yeah, I get invited because I come from more of an outsider's background of design, or at least that's what I, I thought. Um, I spent most of my career working for brands and figuring out how to get people to buy things and consume things. And it wasn't until I hit a, a block where I realized I no longer wanted to sell people things, I actually wanted to solve problems. And those problems were related to communities that I identified with and which led me on a journey of design and then I went to grad school, got a degree in design thinking, and like first semester, I realized like, wait a minute, this is no different from what I've already been doing and for what, what my community already does. And so even as I started to develop what was my design career, I realized that really the paradigm shift had to be that we could not start to see ourselves in the space of a designer. We could not start to see ourselves in the space of actually creating the solution, right? So I felt like design always came from this, like came down from the sky, the, like there's these rules of design that are given to you and your community inherits it and you're thankful for it. And I realized one day I was like, no, actually, wait a minute, the, the best designers, my favorite designers are my parents who, came here as immigrants, me coming here as an uh, immigrant and understanding the power that is within that. And mm -hmm. so ever since I was able to realize that in myself and that I wouldn't reach a level of self-actualization until I can fully start to harness my power as a 
solution oriented person, a person who could add value. Um, I realized I couldn't do that until I started to create platforms to do that. So thus being able to create a publication that's purely meant to identify and highlight design in places that people wouldn't consider design or even with my studio and the type of work that we do. And every single day I have a conversation with my co-founders and both of the studio and the publication, we always say, we're not a black design studio. We're not a black design publication. We are a publication that's created by black people. So thus it has inherent traits of blackness, but that does not mean that we're trying to go out and highlight every single black designer or black architect. And even when clients reach out to us and the work seems like it's grounded in diversity and inclusion, we don't say no, but we take that as an opportunity to actually educate and say, let's be proactive and not just be reactive. So I'm gonna come right back to you, New, and ask you about some of that, um, some of that space that you're working on creating. So I know that part of being this role as someone who's coming from an outsider perspective in these spaces is holding people accountable and calling out stuff that is not accountable and that's not equitable. And I wanna hear from you what the labor that you've put in to doing that has been like and what some of your experience in that area has felt like. Yeah, I think it, just to pick up from where I left off, um, it's a lot of labor, it's tiresome. Yeah. I definitely um, put a tax on it. If you, if, 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 if I need to, like that is, um, I feel like that should be compensated for. But a lot of times what tends to happen is we will get approached to say, hey, we want to speak to 16 year old black kids who are into this, right? And what usually tends to happen is we have to start to reframe that because we're like, well, the reason why you want to speak to this person or even right now with the racial reckoning, the reason why you need diversity and inclusion is because you're reacting to a, a gross, gross negligence that you've had and that you've committed throughout whatever process you're trying to facilitate. And so what we usually try to do is that to use the opportunity to say, okay, well, what starts to happen when we become proactive, right, instead of reactive? And what does that look like? And how might we actually start to build spaces that are more proactive than, than reactive? And in that, we try to mirror back to the client or whoever, like, here is what you're asking for, but really what you're asking for is still within this scope that is not inclusive. It's still within the scope that is fairly limited within that. And so there is a journey that happens and usually that process can, can happen in a very eloquent way with, with a deck and we, we talk through it, but sometimes it's just very blatant to just say, oh yeah, like the way you're considering this is too limited, the scope is too limited, and here are your pitfalls. Like here are where we're going to hit a wall. And usually if the person is engaging with us, they're receptive to that. And if they're not, we just say thank you, but no thank you, good luck on your endeavors. Yeah, thanks so much. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Yeta, because I know that you're also challenging frameworks from the onset and calling out the ways in which people aren't um, designing from an inclusive standpoint at the get. Right, yeah. And uh, since you've covered it so well, I, I think what I'd like to address is my worry uh, regarding the strategies that we actually use as or in seeking um, social justice or in addressing accessibility. Um, and I, I've seen um, many um, accessibility and inclusion and, and diversity initiatives mature um, and change strategies, et cetera. And one of the, certainly in the field of disability, uh, the there are a number of regulations. We've the, the community has reached a, a point where it's embedded in, or the accountability systems, the way to ensure that there's compliance, are embedded in policies and regulations. And the difficulty there is that um, regulations and requirements and measures and metrics and those things we use to to keep people accountable require um, static simple testable criteria and that makes 
a huge mismatch between what we're actually trying to do, which is to support diversity. Um, it requires this one size fits all approach to how we, what the rules that we tell people to follow. And so uh, uh, one of the, the things that we've been looking at is how do we do this in a different way so that um, there are ways of encouraging a much deeper thinking about the diversity of individuals that we need to address. Um, the, the area that concerns me right now is the evidence that we're trying to gather regarding whether uh, we are meeting um, our goals, our criteria, et cetera, um, whether we are being accountable and the, the we're using metrics and measures uh, that require people to be counted within bounded uh, groupings. And then we're saying, okay, um, this bounded grouping is being discriminated against because it, in comparing it to the, the general population. But my concern there is um, what happens to small minorities and outliers, people that don't fit easily into those bounded categories or groups. I've seen the same pattern happen before um, where uh, a company will say, oh, we've met all the criteria, look at our lovely metrics, we are a model in inclusion. And then um, when someone approaches with a concern or a need that isn't amongst the list of those set criteria, uh, they're um, excluded and they're told, well, if if uh, this isn't enough, then it's your problem. Um, and so it becomes even harder for the individuals that don't belong in those checklists or that aren't addressed by those, those bounded categories um, to actually uh, achieve justice or inclusion. So the, those are some of the things that I've been mulling over at the moment. How do we create a more diversity, complexity and uh, variability uh, friendly system of accountability and um, measurement? Thank you. And yeah, I, I think a lot of the groups that are being left out in the way that we count have been perennially left out. There's been a continuity in terms of who gets overlooked. And, and with that, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, colonial and decolonial mindsets and the ways in which um, a particular framework has resulted in the, the same exclusions and the same disregard for particular groups. And, um, and so I'm gonna turn this over to, uh, to Shannon and to Zara. And what I'm, what I'm asking is um, both uh, how design is implicated in these settler colonial relations, um, as well as how it can be mobilized for resistance. And I mean this both in a in a um, structural way of thinking, as well as how our own positionality in relation to these historical structures and this, these frameworks um, impacts what sort of contributions we can offer. And so, Shannon, I'll start with you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, when I think about this, I kind of like I'm gonna. Um, piggyback kind of on what New said earlier about everybody being a designer. Um, and I think that I would take that same approach. Uh, I take that same approach to planning and specifically when I'm engaging communities on land use development proposals um, because there is inherent knowledge in there about how the space functions, how it works, what is a space that is considered sacred, what is the space that is considered home, and how are we defining home? A lot of people don't always get that opportunity. So what makes this place feel familiar and worthwhile and worthy of, of, of protecting and preserving? And I also know that as communities that live through, I think like when I say we're also inherently planners, I think about Africville. Africville is a community in Nova Scotia that everybody knows was bulldozed um, because of a white colonial gaze on the folks who lived in that community, um, African, um, folks who were largely loyalists um, escaping slavery and were promised land 
in Canada for fighting on behalf of the British Empire. And we know that that community was bulldozed and was um, subject to a lot of environmental racism, noxious uses positioned right beside a thriving community, otherwise thriving community. And I think about the fact that that was a community that was made of only made by the hands of African um, descended persons. And um, also like just the design of it, the, the church and the school were central points um, of, co of cohesion and connectivity for the residents of that community. And so I think about how they designed that community with that in mind, um, points of connectivity. I think about the folks who had to trot a path to a version of freedom. Um, and those paths can be considered what is understood in planning as desire paths. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have to really consider the fact that there's always a negotiation with space that folks who are not necessarily represented in um, design and planning and, and these trendy conversations about active transportation and um, you know community space that are, are I, sorry, I lost my train of thought here, but I'm just saying that all of these folks have charted a path to freedom and made um, a way for themselves through the wake of colonialism. So I don't wanna take that for granted when I think about this question, because there's always that negotiation of space. I think the biggest challenge that we run into is the impact of hyper surveillance on our communities and what that ends up facilitating for us um, as black people. And I, I just emphasize that just because I know that there is systemic underinvestment and systemic neglect in communities that are deemed to be seen as having a high representation of um, racialized folks, um, which does you know, facilitate and, and contribute to um, poor infrastructure and, and other outcomes, which I consider to create hostile, um, hostile mappings um, onto certain, um, losing my word, certain territories, I guess would be the word. Um, but that's what I think about when I think about how design is implicated and it's always been renegotiated and mobilized. So I think that they're, the only thing is the hyper surveillance, but also the fact that those aren't honored in any type of way. Um, and there's no meaningful engagement with that. And um, one of the, I don't know if I'm running out of time, but one of the, um, things I think about is also the fact that I'll just put it there. I'll just say it, but I'm going to bring it up in my, the next question I'm asked is, sure. green, is green space. And when my neighborhood had experienced um, the closure and condemnation of the units, one of the first things I did was look at the tree in my backyard. Um, and the fact that people say over and over again that Jane and Finch doesn't have green space and there's a lack of green space in communities like Scarborough, Rexdale, Jane and Finch. Um, but I know that I grew up with that tree and before it used to, the, that, that was a, it's a coniferous tree. The fir tree used to like touch my hair, my head when I was a child, that's how short it was. And by the time I had to move out of my neighborhood, it was up in the sky, like almost scraping the almost scraping the sky. <laughs> and so those are the also the, the missed um, heritages um, that we're also kind of throwing away um, when we start to, you know, not consider the, the what is what what happens in places that people who are predominantly racialized um, live in. So Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate the way that you drew our focus both to the ways in which there's a neglect of investment in these communities, mm -hmm. as well as um, investment in the wrong thing, right? With this hyper surveillance, that's still a resource okay. commitment. That's, that's still right. spending mm -hmm. money and making decisions for that group in terms of what's needed. That's right. Sarah, um, do you want to jump in on this too? I have too many things to say. Like my my hand is tired. I'm like still writing down comments from our opening. <laughs> I think like um, new. You planted the seed. You were like, who gets to call themselves a designer? So now we're all going to get angry and respond to that because I know it's like it's such a triggering comment. I think and you know I really want to pick up on on news comment and I mean everyone's and Shannon's in particular because. I think, so Africa is such a fascinating example because I imagine, we can't see all of you, but I imagine there's a ton of nodding heads, right? And people are like, yes, that's terrible. That's terrible, we know. And um, I just wanna bring it back to designers 
I think we talk about design as this sort of esoteric thing. Design is composed of a collection of people who help make choices, right? Who are helping make these choices. And so I think part of decolonizing design to borrow from Dory Tunstall's theory is to really implicate ourselves as individuals and our understand our own identities and our, how they play into being guardians of the structures. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I can say that like, you know, I, I can see all the ways in which I, I have been that way, even as someone who's worked in this space, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm you know, a, a settler in, in Canada. I, my family was a settler for many generations on the East Coast of Africa, where I think I'm from, but actually from India and other play in Portugal way before settlers because of religious persecution. But, but sort of nonetheless, here I am doing all of those things that I don't want to be doing. And so I just, instead of, you know, talking about design generally, I really want to talk about us as individuals. And that gets to news, news, you know, hot comment, which is who gets to call themselves a designer. And, you know, I have been witness and party to capital D credential designers um, colonizing design. And saying this is who gets to be a designer and this this is who isn't. I, I talked about not being an accredited architect. Architects, planners, there is a boundary around it. This is for some people, not for all people. When to, you know, to news point, our parents are great designers, our communities are great designers. What it means in the modern era to be a great designer is to be able to understand needs and identify needs and collectively serve and design for them together. So who's to say <laughs> this colonization of design by designers saying you're in, you're out. And I've seen this. I ran a design, a corporate design practice for many years. I saw sort of the, the warfare between the credential designers and the folks who didn't have training, but really felt like they could intuitively do it. Um, so I think that's a huge part is we have to look at our own practices um, and not just say, oh, that's terrible that that happens, but recognize that we're, you know, when you're talking about surveillance, um, we need to pay attention to the things we're designing. I think what I've seen is design has become increasingly more ubiquitous and, you know, they designers find themselves at City Hall and they find themselves at all of these fascinating new places where we never were sort of even recognized. Everyone's gone really gotten really excited and forgotten that we have to pay attention to what we're being asked to do in these new places. And and I, I think that's what freaks me out, to be honest, a lot, is that because everyone's so enchanted by having the proverbial seat at the table or being in the door, whatever we want to call it, everyone's forgetting that, no, if you're being asked to design surveillance that looks at communities who have typically been, um, that's been weaponized against them. Um, you're, you know, labor, Mike Montero, who's kind of, I don't know, I, I don't know if he's fully lucid, but he has this great quote, which, which is, labor without counsel is not design. And I think that we go along with things because design is getting, you know, to Shannon, to your point, it's getting, it's one of those trendy conversations. Um, the other thing I'll just say is, uh, I guess where I also see us sort of complicit in this colonial practice and um, in in the idea of, you know, you asked about mobilizing to resistance, um, to the point of where designers are showing up and all of the really interesting places, designers now can have jobs um, and whatever kind of designer you are. I think there's a, there's this, um, you know, great American thinker, doer, everything, or uh, Rashad Robinson, who talks about converting our presence into power and power being the ability to change the rules. Mm -hmm. And so I've always thought about that in the community context, in the context of the places that I've worked, which is success isn't measured unless there's a transfer of wealth and of resources, access and decision-making. Um, but I now think about it in this conversation, I'm thinking about it as all of these folks who are listening in, I'm assuming a lot of you are design-minded or designers. I, I think the responsibility within this sort of resistance is to, to convert our presence into power, to start changing the rules. Um, and that involves changing the rules around what, we're, what we are pushing back on the design up. So things like surveillance, things like our democracy. Um, and I just think it's increasingly so important for us to take that presence that we have and start really turning it into power in the context that that there's power here. Um, and in the context, if you're, if you're sitting here watching this, you're probably interested in helping sort of, you know, push on power structures to create the opportunity for more collaborative design with folks who are most affected by the things that they're trying to create. So um, 
so yeah, I, I just think that, that decolonizing design starts with designers letting go and trusting that I, I just, and the last thing I'll say, I'm probably running out of time too. Um, but the last thing I'll just say is that this was the thing that, that you know, it shouldn't have been surprising, but planners and architects who just would do go out of their way to undermine community voices and be paternal about, oh, thanks for your, thanks for your idea. We're going to go run away and like turn it into a pretty drawing. <laughs> and it's like, no, just like, let's mm -hmm. help everyone understand why drawing matters, what it does, but how to do it. Like, you know, this whole, like, mm -hmm. we scurry away with your consultation or your feedback with your user insights. We scurry away and make magic happen. I'm so over that. Like I'm really oh, over and you that. Might handle, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and Shannon, I'll just say that uh, about ten minutes ago, I had my partner do the exact same thing. I was texting. Turn him on the light. light. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, it's getting dark. <laughs> I I have the opposite issue. So spoiler alert: I'm not in <laughs> uh, LA, and now. The, the sun is shifting and you're going to see, it's going <laughs> to land right on my face. I'm going to have to keep, keep moving. So if you see me like this, very soon. So these, uh, this discussion that we're having about the ways in which designers themselves should see th themselves as implicated in processes that produce exclusions really leads us to our next question, which is who's being excluded, who's being left out. And so um, I want to I want to ask you to and Shannon to talk to us a little bit about the imagined audience, and the imagined users of inclusive design and who we visualize these folks to be and who we forget to visualize, who we forget to consider in the ways in which we, we work from established norms and expectations of um, where our designs are being taken up uh, and who's accessing them. So Yetta, do you want to start us off? Yeah, um, I, I love uh, everything that you've brought into the conversation, Sarah, Jen, and Anu. And I, I think uh, just following up on the theme of um, decolonization, I, I think there, there needs to be a fairly radical rethinking of our traditional notions of design as well. Um, the systems are most often biased towards the average, the majority, the largest customer base, M much of the economic research, the market research, the usability research is all sort of focused on this imagined uh, group, whether it's a persona, an archetype, or um, whoever we think the, the the general market is. And so what, what we've been talking about is co-designing with the people of lived experiences of the, the barriers that we're facing, the people that can't use or have difficulty with the current design. So not the people that are currently um, the intended group that the thing is designed for, but in fact, the the very individuals that cannot use or have difficulty, the complaints, those um, uh, people that are putting in uh, complaints into the suggestion box mm -hmm. that are um, creating <laughs> all of the noise about, or, or and also the people that don't feel that they have a voice to complain about it. And so the, the re rationale for that is, much more than that that is a good thing to do or that it, it supports inclusion. But um, if you think about it, uh, individuals that are the current customer base are probably quite complacent and they don't have new and innovative ideas. It helps with innovation, it helps with dynamic <laughs> resilience, it helps with adaptability. Um, in terms of the, we, we, we've also been rethinking um, the design thinking squiggle. I, I m most of do pe pe have people seen the design thinking squiggle that sort of uh, goes around and around and around and then ends in a single thread. Um, so uh, our inclusive design process is actually the uh, it goes in the opposite direction. Uh, we call it the virtuous tornado. Uh, rather than uh, iterating continuously and um, through a competitive process, choosing a one particular winning design, what we try to do is to create a system that uh, actually psych iteratively cycles out to be more and more inclusive and at each point ask who's missing, 
who's still not here at the table, who's not helping us to design an inclusive system whose needs are not met. And for that reason, we also um, never say that we're finished or complete or the, that we've fixed it or that it's done. It's never done because the context is constantly changing. Um, there's always someone that we haven't thought about and people change. And so it's a, a rethinking of not just um, who we're designing for, how we're designing, who we're including, uh, what what is the process of design. Thanks so much, Yetta. Shannon, do you want to answer that, that as well? Sure. Um, so I really appreciate what you just said, Yetta, about, you know, how research is and market research is kind of creating the baseline for a lot of the design outcomes we see. Um, and then the fact that those who are who most benefit from the outputs are kind of lulled into a complacency. Um, and um, there's a term for that when you think about planning and urban theory. It's, it's something that Jay Pitter talks about a lot. It's called spatial entitlement. And I think that that is also an, a byproduct of that complacency is that everything is mine and I don't have to question it. I think about it. I take up this much space. Um, and so a lot of communities don't necessarily have that um, opportunity to feel entitled in the same way. And the impact of that, you know, does kind of facilitate a lot of the, the, the lack of feelings of homes and things like that that I was speaking about earlier, but also how folks are thinking about designing the space and who they have in mind. And I'm thinking specifically about revitalization communities, just because that's something that's been my, it was my research interest while I was in school. Um, and it's been, it's been my lived experience. And I think about the fact that social mix and mix and, um, and mixed use communities are like the most, that's, that's the imagination of the provincial policy statement and our growth plans when it comes to planning and development. And then that's also the vision we place onto revitalization communities as well. And so I just know that in, uh, in communities that are being revitalized, the baseline is like, folks who are lower income don't necessarily feel at home in those communities after they've been redeveloped um, because all of the services um, tend to cater to the more higher income folks. And there's also the spatial, the, the micro segregation that happens in small, on these small lots where you have um, parcels of land being dedicated just to private market and then parcels being dedicated to the, to the um, Low in, lower income folks or folks who are on a subsidized rent um, system. And those things can facilitate a lot of feelings of hostility towards neighbors. Like it just doesn't promote positive social mix or social cohesion. Um, so I just wonder about that. And then also the realities of um, folks who are undergoing that change and how that impacts their me memory, heritage and, and those things. Um, so, I think about that. And then I also think about the, sorry, I'm just going over my notes, the green space access and the fact that there is a narrative that kind of creates correlations between a lack of green space, poverty and poor health outcomes, but nobody really speaks about how to animate the green space that exists in communities that are deemed to have none or how to reframe it with, reframe that conversation with a lack, with, um, underutilization versus and identify what hinders enjoyment and we know that, that folks who are in these communities where the where there's a presumed correlation between lack of green space poverty and poor health um, are also folks who are working around the clock um, to try to keep rent paid and keep food on the table and so we have to kind of consider that labor and the issues and disparities in the labor market are actually what is facilitating underutilization of green space in certain communities. And in that regard, these spaces won't get the attention to have resources dedicated to them um, to, to promote um, points of convening for certain residents. And again, hyper surveillance is an issue in that regard. Um, once communities of color do convene more, there is a lot more hyper surveillance. Um, but I'm just thinking about the fact that in, Tr in Trinity Bellwoods is a great example of it. Um, where they drew the circles 
<laughs> in the grass during the middle of a pandemic um, to allow people to continue to use that space. It kind of promoted more use of the space. Um, but in a community like mine where the green space can be a hydro corridor that has a built a purpose built trail and bike network doesn't have the same type of uh, maintenance um, or or promote the same types of points of connect connection for community members. So a lot of the times the the disregard of the assets in communities that are considered low income um, actually perpetuate things that might not be true and pr create a mythical norm about mm -hmm. neighborhoods that um where folks don't have that same access to entitlement of the spaces just because it's not designed in a certain way and they don't feel like the accessibility is there. Thank you so much. I'm, you, moderators almost never do this, but Shannon, I'm gonna actually ask you to keep speaking because okay. in one of our early conversations about this, yeah. you said something that really stayed with me for a long time and I kept thinking about. Mm -hmm. And so I want everyone listening to, uh, to have the benefit of that as well. Okay. Um, you talked about imagined senses of safety when oh. we shift the uses of space right. and the ways in which we prioritize particular folks safety and we don't think of the ways in which that makes other people feel unsafe in these same places that get revitalized right. and i was wondering if you could just speak to that briefly too because i thought it was such a beautiful and important point hopefully i can say it in the same way um but i think because i also research and think about the impact of um like the loss of that space and trying to mm, renegotiate your space because I think that like I grew up in a neighborhood that wasn't necessarily considered safe but it was home and so my mom always told me um home like you have to come home no matter what's happening on the streets you have to come home um it's your safe space um and so I just know that there hmm, I, hmm, I'm just trying to think about what I said um sorry but, I'm putting you on the spot it's okay but I'm thinking about that because you know, in communities where there is unfortunately a legacy of gun violence, there's mm -hmm. still, that's still the safest place on earth for a lot of communities. And so when you're built, you're kind of raising communities to be rebuilt, you're kind of dismantling that mental map and how they used to navigate the, their communities on their own um, with and, and how they understood what safety felt like. So I think about that. And then I also think about the fact that there are communities that what it, with the presence of the impact of gun violence, um, there's also spaces in the community that kind of folks know not to go to. Mm -hmm. And so there's also that reality as well, um, where you're kind of disrupting that flow, I guess, and that can also promote more gun violence. Um, mm -hmm. I think about the fact that the redesign of Regent Park, um, it, it, I think one of the things that's always challenging about revitalizations is, is that um, there's this assumption that, as I mentioned earlier, prior to the community being revitalized, it's deemed unsafe. There's a lack of connectivity to the street grid and like the transit net and the, and the dominant network. Um, but what about, what does opening that up spell for certain communities? What does that mean? There's usually, a, there's actually is an increase in drive-by shootings, for example. So when you're talking about safety for certain communities, you know, that is also a challenge is, is that reality that you're, you might be um, taking away those spots where issues are more likely to happen and more predictable. And, and that's obviously patterns that get built up over time. But um, the impact on the surrounding community, gun violence is a public health issue. You know, how do we consider that in this new design process going forward and, and the impact? So I think about it from this perspective of dismantling people's mental maps of their communities and then mm -hmm. also the implication on safety and, and violence. And Toronto has a huge gun violence issue and um, thinking about that as well. Thanks so I hope that looks like what you yeah, were talking about. Thank you very much. Yeah. There's a similar pattern. I don't know if I can interject in in the disability field as well. And it's this um, notion of dignity of risk because there is a paternalistic um, supposed assumption or presumption about what 
is safe and what isn't safe. And so it, it creates this systemic issue because if you don't have the dignity of risk, you are more at risk, right? And if if there's an imposed sense or a, a, an externally uh, interpreted notion of what is safe for you, then it cannot become an internalized uh, knowing of what or knowledge of, of what in fact risk looks like, what is acceptable risk and, and um, what, what, what is the safety that you can sustain yourself. But yeah. so it, it's, it's interesting to see this, um, a similar pattern um, emerge in, in a number of different areas. Yeah, a lot of this seems to be tied to the, oh, sorry. Yeah, Zara, what did you want to add? <laughs> I'm getting on, on the train. You two went rogue, so I'm just going to quickly, I promise to be quick, but I just want to root it back in the in, in the practice because I think, I, I know that everyone's agreeing out there, and I just want to remind us that, you know, I think some of the processes that create these spaces that we think we're designing, many people out there are process designers, right? I, I wrote on my, on my, in my notebook here, imposed and disorienting. Um, and, you know, I've heard the language of co-design being used a lot. And then I go into these spaces and I'm like, you're imposing this very disorienting process. And people are trying to understand what's going on while they're trying to understand the future of their community. And I think we talk about like, I can't, this isn't about consultation or engagement. So I want to go down that road. But I think that, you know, as designers, I've seen folks show up in these spaces where they're designing cool processes and everything's got bells and whistles. And it's, you know, quote unquote, accommodating. But I think this language of disorienting and dismantling people's mental maps of what it means to be part of, like when you go into a space that's supposed to be a decision-making space for your community and it looks nothing like the way that you come together, where it's not a circle, it's not storytelling, mm -hmm. it's a PowerPoint or it's yeah. a, like, you know, that's that's dismantling our mental map of how decisions get made because this mm -hmm. space was supposed to be for me. And now we're using this North American Eurocentric model mm -hmm. to like, get me super engaged. Um, and so I think, again, that's a process design and, and a lot of designers who do human-centered design work, that's the process, right? So I think it's it's just worth flagging that when we when I listen to Shannon, I think about all those rooms where the community was quote unquote engaged for co-design yeah. and um, you know how disorienting those spaces can be too. Thanks so much for jumping in on that and, and, and drawing that to our attention. Um, I also want to shift us to the next question, which I think is part of this conversation too, because um, we've been talking a lot about the folks who have the power to make these choices or to set up these design processes. And a lot of that has to do with ownership. So uh, a theme that's, that's come up through some of the discussions is this paternalistic approach. So who's even in a position to exercise that sort of paternalism? And what's the relationship between ownership and design? How is design getting influenced by these structural inequities? And who has the resources to determine how we shape spaces? And so Nu, I'm, I'm gonna turn to you to, to start us off on that discussion. Cool. Oh, okay. um, I think especially yeah. with this one thing I think about and especially a statement that I say that if people either love or they hate is I'd say that design is in love with itself, right? And by being in love with itself, design is in love with outputs. It's in love with creating things, right? And really when when I took a step back and I looked at what was considered design, what is considered good design, I realized that it's really more about fidelity, right? Like how beautiful does this thing or process look or function, right? But when I think about fidelity, I really think about resources. Because in order to achieve a certain fidelity, you need a certain amount of resources. That could be time, education, that could be like, oh, you know someone who, understands kerning of typefaces and can lay you out a deck. And so what usually tends to happen is that design uses these tricks, which I think are cheap tricks in order to say, this is good because it's tied to this level of fidelity. And so what tends to happen is that people who do not have resources get skirted off to the side when it comes to design because what they're producing is not as polished and doesn't have that level of fidelity. And so usually I try to disconnect, and I'm doing that even now in my process of 
trying to disconnect myself or my love of fidelity from my process of design. And another thing that I actually lean into heavily is, oh, I'm frozen. Can you hear me though? Wait, as long as you can hear me. Sorry, I myself. We can hear you. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. Uh -oh. oh, but now you're oh, but I'm, I'm back. He's coming back. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you can still hear me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, um, another thing that I feel like design is in love with besides just the output. Well, actually, it is outputs, right? And mm -hmm. I feel like outputs can be very limiting. And so for me, I try to steer closer to process because I feel like it's it's within process. Let me stop my camera, restart my camera. Are we back now? No. Okay, well, I guess I'm a black square for now. But <laughs> in, ter in terms of process, really what I start to think about is how can we start to use other people's processes and ways and methodologies to inspire and actually create new opportunities for us to reflect on our own process? Because especially if you're not considered a designer and you don't have technical training in design, you may not be able to create the same output, but you can find inspiration in a process and you can start to identify that the work that you do and how you operate in facilitating or producing is also a process in itself and can also be considered and deemed a design process if that's what you want to consider and deem it. And so I think really when it comes to ownership, it's really about actually democratizing design and actually trying to build more inclusive spaces that people who may not be the facilitator or may not be the person who's producing the output can actually start to input into it. And I'm actually like, I work hard with my clients to like, blur the lines between what is the community you want to serve and the actual designer. And I even tried to push to say, well, if you want to continue facilitating design, we need to start thinking more about how can we start to build on ramps and not just in terms of what, what a co-creation process could be where it's like, well, or we have this community meeting here, we have this check-in here, here's the output we presented, high five. Like I've, um, We've been doing processes where we embed members of the communities in the team from the beginning, even down to allowing them to scrutinize the actual process itself, the actual scope itself, to the point where when they come in and, and they're disoriented, that's part of the design process. Because we want to say, okay, well, what is so disorienting about this? And how can we make this something that is not as disorienting so that you can actually engage and we can continue on throughout this process. And so within the work that we do, we try to build in that level of honesty and accountability to the, the community that we're engaging with. Thanks. That really pulls on a lot of transformative justice uh, language to think about prioritizing process as part of what we're doing with design. So it's great to hear that. Zara, do you want to also add to this question? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, you all can't see our snaps, but we have a private chat that's basically just all snaps for each other. Um, and, and new, you know, your comment is, is so resonant because I think that's what, you know, I, I ran a, a community design practice for 10 years before, for a short period of time running a corporate design firm. Uh, uh, and, one of the things I just couldn't wrap my mind around for so long was when people were negotiating consent forms and they were trying to write into the consent, oh, we should be able to go back to the end user. And, and I was like, yeah, of, of course. <laughs> like, and, and in the consent form, you have to write, you know, how many times you want to, um, you want to go back. And I'm like, but aren't, aren't they just aren't they with us the whole time? Like, what, what is this? And so, you know, this, these um, this notion of of you know there's design and then there's participatory design. Um, I think when I hear New talking about his practice, he, you know that is his practice. That is my that's I think all of our practice. And I I would love designers to stop sort of segregating the folks who want to engage people all the way through versus have them just engaged in checkpoints. Um, I, I would like that to to sort of start to shift our practice because we grip onto the design process because we want to be relevant. And that's where, you know, planners and architects and, and folks who work in that space that Shannon was talking about also, you know, tend to grip on to um, grip onto their processes and their practices and their and their and their way, their quote unquote way 
because you know no one wants to be deemed irrelevant. And and so I guess the the thing I'll just add is is for me when I think about ownership, the piece that I'm always trying to pay the most attention to is who makes the decision as to when it's done. When is when are we at the level of fidelity that means complete? And um, when do we, you know, because if for in a lot of the communities I've worked uh, in across Canada, um, there's been moments where a, a design, you know, has been, to, let's say, delivered to them by the city and they're like, this is not what we want. It is incomplete. <laughs> and they're not the ones making the decision, even though they were told this was an engagement process co-design. And I've seen it with service design and I've seen it with policy design and all the policy violence that happens as a result of that. And, and you know, in, in this in its own way, design has its own design violence when we overpromise and we under deliver on the collaborative aspects of it. So for me, ownership is about who's making the ultimate decision. So I've, I've had to write everything down because you're all so smart and I just don't want to forget what you're saying. And I just want to um, stop with this false ownership with our with our communities that we work with when we say that we're rooting it in a user centered problem frame, which I've been complicit in too. I, I've, I've you know tooted that horn, like, <laughs> and and I really think that some of those user centered problem frames that are are motivated by institutions. So I've done tons of work across the public sector at all levels of government where they want to more meaningfully engage communities and individuals who are experiencing the challenge in the design of the solution. But the problem frame is always signed off on by the institution. And so ultimately, the ownership of the quote unquote solution lies with them. So I just want to stop, you know, making these false promises. And I'm okay that, okay, I'm not okay with it, but I accept that there are different types of uh, practices and that we can't change overnight, but let's certainly start naming things accurately. Um, and let us you know, not be giving a false indicator of power sharing um, and of justice and fairness. Let's, let's, let's call things by their true names, right? If you can't name it, you can't change it. So mm -hmm. I think, um, um, uh, yeah, that to me, when I think of ownership, is just who owns the decisions and the decision to say this isn't good enough uh, moving forward. This is, you know, my, my mental map is disoriented of my community. That's not good enough. I'd like it to change, please. And I'd like to lead that change. And um, yeah. Thank you. And you, in, in some of our preliminary discussions, you also had this focus on change and on the future. And so, um, the other panelists should know that they have you to blame for the, the difficult question that we're ending on. <laughs> this is asking us uh, to envision something different going forward. And it's doing so um, recognizing that as, as folks marked as engaged in diversity and equity, um, that we need to identify what the conditions that might need to be in place in order for the sort of practices that we've been discussing to actually be carried out. And, I, and so I wanna ask in closing everyone to answer and then, and then we'll have an opportunity for audience question. What opportunities you see for designers to envision and create a world more equitable than the one that we currently inhabit? And Yita, maybe I'll, I'll start off by asking you to answer this one. Wow, okay, <laughs> you're right, that is a challenging question. I can think of so many things, but um, if I had to boil it down to something, I think we need to stop thinking about one winning design fix or solution and think about design as this ongoing iterative process that continuously strives to engage people that have that have been excluded. And by that, I, I, I definitely mean from the beginning, right from the problem framing, um, what, what is uh, deciding what it is that is the problem. It's not, I, I think there's this notion that co-design or inclusive design is about inviting people to the decision-making table. That's not um, that's not inclusive design from our perspective. It's uh, not just inviting people to be at the decision-making table, it's inviting people to actually design the table. So um, that the, the I, I think the process of design is one of the things that we need to radically redesign um, and we need to engage the individuals that have currently been excluded. And uh, the, the just adding one one additional thing, I, I really like the discussion of the, the actual risks of design because 
design is getting riskier and riskier all the time, certainly in areas of surveillance in terms of, as we're called more to um, participate in many, many different decision-making systems, a lot of the, the decision-making systems are perpetuating the inequities and the unfairness and the damage that uh, is there, the, the biggest damage that is sort of horizontal and that extends across all of the other crises is this inequity and disparity. Um, it, almost everything we're facing at the moment can be traced back to that. And so uh, the responsibility of design is awesome. It is profound and we really need to think about what are the risks here. We often get caught in this, well, certainly in, in the area that I work in, um, in the digital area, there is this techno triumphalism, this techno solutionism that um, designers or technology is going to fix things or that um, you know, progress is a, a unidirectional thing and that we have to keep accelerating it or innovation or whatever it is that is the clarion cry of why we need to do something. Um, and I, I think we need to step back and consider who's who's going to be impacted by this, who is going to be excluded by this, and uh, really rethink and consider our processes, um, especially our design processes. Thanks so much. Shannon, do you want to answer that as well? Um, yes, and that question of like, you know, we really need to think about what the risks are. That's something that kind of drives my entire perspective. I don't think that there's a lot of people who can relate to seeing a rendering of your new community and running away crying in tears because it just was so gut, you feel gutted, you know? Um, and so that is an experience that not many people have. And so how do we ensure that folks who have to interface with certain processes don't have to walk away feeling like they've lost a huge piece of them, <laughs> you know? Um, and there's not many ways to say goodbye to place because I think Toronto is very, they, doesn't have memory um, <laughs> that, they, that they really wanna hold on to. So um, I think about that, that question of how, how, is this, how are people really impacted on the ground level? But I also think about the decision makers as, as a planner, um, all of the all of the proposals, whether I'm working for a municipality or a private firm, council decides. Um, <laughs> council decides what is appropriate, what isn't appropriate, and what the best recommendations to go forward with are. And so, I think that we have to also reimagine our governance structures, and we have to be more. We have to promote more civic engagement around um, the issues of design because I don't think that folks who are sitting in council chambers for decades, sorry to say, um, really know and understand and feel what the community feels as, it's, um, as they're negotiating change. And so there has to be an exercise in civic engagement that allows more people to become involved and um, start to set the agenda for, for um, change. And, and, and I think it's also challenging just because policy, like Zara mentioned, policy balance, it's my first time hearing that concept. Um, but I feel like we're also subject to a lot of that and a lot of times our voices kind of go into that echo chamber of policy creation, but never really see any meaningful output. And so um, there's also that risk there, but I still think it's worthwhile um, to have folks more representative of communities. Um, Toronto's 50% multicultural, like it, diverse races and cultures and ethnicities. And, and so more representation is what's needed to help push this process forward as well. Thanks so much. And uh, New, could you also speak to that, please? Oh, and you're on mute. Awesome, I'm back. So when I think of designing for a more inclusive future, really what I think about is the actual role of designers and designers moving from moving away from just being practitioners to being facilitators and being in love with not just creating outputs, but creating conditions um, and platforms for other people to be able to 
empower themselves and find ways to exert where they want to add value. In which I think really like the hard part with that is that design has been spoken up to be this, yeah, this solve all that there's one solution that can solve everything. And there definitely is um, some romance behind that. And there's been a lot of time and energy spent by specific agencies that have branded specific methodologies that they've been able to sell. And in a capitalistic society, you need to sell, make profit. You need to continue growing. Like we said, we need to innovate, innovate, innovate. And in that process, um, I think we lost the actual like value and scope of design just from its purest essence of being able to find problems that that move across different spectrums and find ways of solving that. And then so in that, we look at ourselves as we're the only ones who can actually solve it. And so there's so much that could be learned from many different types of fields, same way how design thinking pulled in so many different types of research to, to be able to create a, a more open form of design. I think there is a evolution where it's really even going into like really understand, okay, what is facilitation? What is holding space? What does it look like to actually bring someone in who uh, that you can actually nurture through a process and, and not just leave them with an output, but leave them with their own process or practice that they can use to then be able to spread that to others. Thanks so much. It's a little setting aside of ego, which is <laughs> which is pretty challenging often. Thanks. Yeah. And Zara, I'm gonna leave you on this big weighty question that you that you inspired. Uh, what what conditions <laughs> do uh, need to be in place in order to allow designers to contribute to an equitable, accessible, and anti-racist future? Well, you know, simple five-part answer here that I'm scrolling down. <laughs> Hopefully coherent. Okay, I'm gonna quickly list them off as I've been listening to my colleagues. One, I'm so about, I'm so done with hearing about this proverbial table. It's like we're building another house, there's a house party happening, everyone's gonna find their jam in the house party. It's gonna be like a whole bunch of different communities within it. Like I'm so done with the destination being the table. So let's stop talking about the table to you this point. The second is, and I really can't stress this enough, there are not participatory designers or equity by designers or designers practice it's that's design so if you want the responsibility of being a designer you're not a social purpose designer or a social innovation designer if you if you care truly and deeply about design this is the practice this is this is what we should be doing and it's reckless and irresponsible not to and i am pointing fingers i've been complicit in this too I, i'm saying it's time for us to hold ourselves accountable which is not be afraid of reflecting on our own practice and talking about it. Um, one of the things that I think is really important when we reflect is understanding the context of into which we're designing. I love having artifacts and Toinette Carroll's equity by design framework. Um, but really the reason I show it is because she says before any good design process starts, understand the context, the history and healing that needs to happen and the power constructs that prevent people from engaging with your process. So let's not be afraid of reflecting and redesigning our process. You just already got a head start. Um, and then, the, and then I guess the last sort of piece and a half, four and a half points is, you know, Shana, to your point about promoting civic engagement around design and this like experts on tap, not on top. I think the thing that I've been really, I've watched really closely is designers being scared to transfer their skills. So when communities do rise up, designers need to be on tap to say, okay, here's the skill, like here's some skills that might be useful. Um, and, and really to, to reframe our role as you know, versus like holier than now solution builders to news earlier point, but really as an enabling function for a just and fair society. And I think that if we can reframe ourselves, we can find ourselves on in in the process in the virtuous tornado um, that Yuta was talking about. But we'll find a home. Don't be worried about that. There will be tons of ways for us to be of service. Um, but remember, we're enablers, right? And and we can lead by enabling um, and, and supporting with the skills that we do have, hard and soft skills. So. Well, thank you so much um, for all of you sharing that. And then hopefully we've got some questions um, from our virtual audience. Oh, I see one come up already. And it's, uh, it's aimed at you, Yuta. Um, the framework you mentioned, but always being in an iterative process where you constantly stop and think about who is not being considered. How do you 
do that from an inclusive perspective. Right, <laughs> yeah. So um, one of the, um, uh, okay, I, 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 I'm in an academic environment at the moment, but we're engaged in something that is somewhat, um, uh, or hasn't been part of an academic environment for quite some time, and that is uh, what we call applied r research. So the the when I was talking about the um, virtuous tornado, another part of that is that we go through a full iteration. It isn't um, what's called in software a waterfall process where there's a ton of planning and planning and planning and then you go behind a curtain and you create something and you launch it and you tell people this is what you wanted and this is what is needed. Um, what we try to do is at, at each iteration actually have a full cycle of something that's testable, something that's that's mm -hmm. tangible, that somebody can actually evaluate and understand and know what, what are the, the the issues still with this. And we engage everyone that's going to be impacted by that design in that process. So uh, the, it, at, at the end of that, evaluating um, the this tangible, testable thing that people can actually imagine, we then ask, okay, who who's still not here? Who, um, by virtue of of having done this in this way um, is going to be either, are, who are we creating a barrier for, who um, uh, will feel the impact of this, but hasn't been here as part of the decision-making process. And then we go through a, another iteration after having sought out those individuals. And that at each iteration, we also look at, re-look at the process, um, what didn't work, this last round, um, what uh, what were the 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 foreign sort of uncomfortable things, and is that discomfort a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, we have these these fairly um, uh, detailed discussions about what has worked with the process, what uh, what hasn't worked with the process, um, how do we need to change the process given the um, the additional co-designers that are coming to help us, uh, etc. So it and the the uh, every, the things we're designing and, and we started in the digital space as opposed to the architectural or, or in industrial design space where of course um, things are truly never finished or done despite what the market might want to say. That it's it's such a quickly changing adapting, morphing um, environment. Uh, but I, I think the the never being finished um, applies to almost everything we design because our world is changing, our needs are changing, we're variable. Um, we th There's no way that at the beginning, I mean, planning, talk about planning. Um, these uh, these linear logic models that we need to come up with that predict exactly what we're going to do and how we're going to measure whether we've done it five years ahead of time or whatever they're absurd um there's they cause us to increase the risk increase that and and to create systems that don't that won't work for anybody <laughs> really um so that's why we talk about this iterative process that um, needs to, that is it in itself adaptable and creates adaptable systems that um, continuously stretch and, and, and grow to um, accept the uncertainty and variability that's part of the people that will be impacted by it. Thank you for that. I think there's a humility to, to that approach that accepts the fact that exclusions will happen early on and that the, the initial design is not perfect and, and improvement and iteration and criticism is worthwhile. Um, that, that maybe is, is an important feature of that process. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a hard process. And uh, one of the things we always say right at the beginning as well in terms of that notion of bringing so many diverse perspectives together is we will all be offended and we're all going to offend is how we then move on from that process. So making sure that um, that everybody with that's there um, uh, 
understands the value of mistakes, of failure, of yeah. uh, um, constructive critique and mm -hmm. giving and receiving constructive critique, that dissonance, uh, um, diverse perspectives is a, a healthy and constructive thing. Okay, thanks. I think we might have um, opportunity for two more questions. So let's see the next question if there's one. Okay, um, it says, as a design educator, I'd like to ask the panel if they have concrete strategies to suggest that would increase diversity within our student population. Uh, design is seen as a privileged role by so many. Uh, is there anyone who wants to take this on first? Mm. I have a just a, a, a very quick hot take. I don't know how concrete this is, but you know, I was having a conversation um, today with a big planning firm but here based in Toronto. And one of the things we talked about was how planning is so white and so male because like people, people find out about planning like, like well into their lives. <laughs> it's not something that you're exposed to. And, you know, my, my colleague always likes to talk about how um, for a lot of young people, it's like what you see in movies and what you see in pop culture and what you see maybe around you if you're lucky, but it's it's mostly what you consume in pop culture are the um, are the sort of professions you, you sort of line up your mental models of success with. And so I think, you know, I know, I know at OCAD, uh, you know, your Dean of Design has a huge focus on eight to 12 year olds. I think that's so clever because I think if we start to talk about design and not in the context of artifact making, but talk about the process design <laughs> and participatory practice, what we now call design after this panel forever. Um, I, I just think if we start introducing young people to this practice of what it means to be a designer much younger, I think it, 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 they start to you know add it to that list and it becomes a possibility because I think a lot of a lot of young people just aren't exposed to it and they're only exposed to it in this sort of um, Apple product designer versus the kind of designer who can sort of facilitate process. Um, that's one thing I'll say. Yeah, New, I see you nodding and I see you're also in animate form right now. So maybe do you want to jump in before you freeze? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that I agree 100% that you can't really be where you where you don't see. And I think especially one thing that I always try to, because I have to explain to a lot of my friends and family, like when I'm like, yeah, I'm a designer. And they're like, oh, like an artist. And I have to be like, no, well, you know, art is the self-expression from internal to external. I was like, design is a process of solving problems. And they're like, oh, well, you know, like, can you give me some examples? And I tried to give people examples. I think the best scenarios that I have is in processes where I get to work with high school students and get to include them in a process that I don't tell them is design until, surprise, mm -hmm. you've been doing design or you've engaged in the design process. Um, it's hard because even the students that I teach and in, in my class and even when I was in grad school, I always look to try to find like, okay, well, where are the opportunities um, for diversity? Where are the opportunities to create more inclusive um, modes for different people to engage in design? Unfortunately, I see a lot of it being, um, I guess, I see a lot of it falling into this realm of like design engaging with social work in which if you're into social work, you can get into design where there's so many facets of design that I always try to promote and let people know like there's different processes that you already engage in that you're around in that just aren't framed up in that way. And there is an opportunity for you to actually like pursue a different form of design that could yield an output or could yield social engagement, but it's really up to you in that. Right. And I just wanted to, sorry, um, we're talking at the same time, sorry, but I just wanted to also mention that while you have students in your classrooms, that is also such an important time to continue to mentor and nurture them. I know that rates of dropping out of college and university programs are also high among student populations from particular communities. Um, and it, it's mostly about income and supporting yourself, like bare necessities and making sure that you have that um, yeah. while you're be t taking on an education um, that costs a lot of money, um, but also feeling seen in the curriculum 
um, feeling supported when you have different ideas and you have a different lens is also something that will help students stay inside of the classroom. Um, and then also directing them on a path that is one that they can earn a decent income from. Um, when I was doing my master's in, in environmental studies, I had to like boogie into the planning accreditation um, lane um, stream just because it was something that was new to me. As Zara said, I didn't know what all of my counterparts and peers were studying. I learned about it while I was in school. And when I learned that there's an accreditation process so, um, um, attached to my degree program, um, I just figured like, okay, I need to have some skill set that would make me earn a decent living while, you know, after I finish this program, it's so unpredictable. I don't know what I'm going to be. I think that there's also mentorship and guidance in that regard, just because a student is interested in certain issues like social justice, that doesn't mean that they can't still have value to a, a, a professional program or, or stream. Um, and I know that I was discouraged when I was doing my master's from, from taking the professional accreditation program. Um, just because people thought, oh, you talk about race and gender. So, you know, you, it's not worth your time. And it's like, uh, in the long run, yes, it will be because I'm not, I don't know how to feed myself just um, doing research alone. I need to have tangible skills. Um, and so I think that don't shy away from the students who have a broad perspective give them an opportunity to participate in the things that the students who know their parents were designers or their dad's an architect or their 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 uncle or aunt's a planner, urban planner, like they already have an advantage. They're a few paces ahead because the, the path has been set for them and that's why they're even in the classroom. So embrace those students who might not have that same concept. Um, and I think that would be my advice. Can I, can I just add two things? Really I, I'll, I'll let you take add first. Yeah, let you take up. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually designed a, a graduate program in design. And um, the, the way that I address this is, uh, or I mean, I, it was, was co-design, um, is to uh, uh, it, um, create the program and say that what is needed for design is is a radically diverse set of perspectives. So the the recruitment of um, the individuals within the program was as a cohort. The only way we're going to achieve inclusive design is if we have the greatest diversity within the actual cohort. That um, cost a, a whole uh, I mean, it was transgressive of almost everything within the academy. Um, the other po point that I made there was um, that we need to, students need to diversify and differentiate their skills and competencies and rather than compete for a, a one particular uh, understanding of what it is to be a good designer, um, that what we're creating is an inclusive community. So that it was a reflexive process where in the process of learning about inclusive design, you are also creating an inclusive design learning community. Um, all of those things were, um, I mean, all of those things caused a lot of friction with the academy that it was in, even though it was a art and design academy. But I, I think that's the type of, I, I don't think we should settle with just let's add a little bit of diversity into an academic program. I think we need to, we have a responsibility to rethink the academy and academia. And many of the things that Shannon is talking about are things that if we address those, then th those would benefit every student within an, an academic program. So I, I think it, the, the challenge I would put to anyone that is teaching design is let's more inclusively design just education, learning, our conception of knowledge, research, all of those things. That, um, and it, it requires a fairly radical rethinking and disruption of what's happening within the academy because the academy is broken. And um, it's one of the main areas that requires uh, a rethinking, a redesign. <laughs> and Zara, do you want to add on that just before we take our last question? Yeah, really quick. Um, just um, educate, like, you know, I, I've taught in design, I've taught at OCAD, and then now I teach at the University of Toronto. 
And I teach in a more policy oriented class about cities, but we talk about identity and we talk about design, like root your class in a conversation about identity and have everyone understand the identities they bring to their practice and have dialogues about that. And if you need to get educated, go do that to be able to hold space to talk about identities and intersectionality and the barriers that different parts of our identities can create in your class like next week, <laughs> um, like right away. And then and then just building on uh, Shannon's point really quickly around, you know, bring in diverse lectures, all that. I, I think there's also a piece around, please, in design, there's a habit of worshiping white men. Um, the Don Normans, the like, you know, the Steve Jobs, the, the, like, let's please, certainly there are more interesting <laughs> perspectives that can be disruptive to the academy if we just start having students talk about them on mass and they become normed. Um, and so let's let go of this obsession with this sort of altar of white male designers who quote unquote created the practice um, and really think about, I, I mean, just to be really specific, think about your reading list and what you're exposing students to and who you're exposing students to. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And, you know, I like I like News point about his parents being designers and think about the ways in which you're allowing your students to respect where they come from and respect the 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 knowledge that they've already been imbued with and bring that knowledge to the classroom. Um, and one last question. So we have, are there any of the panelists working on projects right now that reflect these new processes, methodologies? Uh, is there hope? <laughs> so many firms, designers aren't interested in these discussions and this work. Um, it, <laughs> even if they're not uh, interested in these things right now, I, I bet they've released statements in the past couple months that have communicated that they are, right? <laughs> and so folks are, Folks are scurrying to figure out how to do this. So, so maybe maybe the panelists want to speak to that a little bit. I, I can kick it off. Um, so yeah, so one project that we worked on that we had the opportunity to employ um, a, a true like a co create co creation um, process is we were designing a after school program that was focused around visual design, music production, and performance for high school students. And in that, we had the fortune of actually having high school students part of the, the research team. Um, and with that, the beauty of it was bringing them into the process and even just introducing them and exposing them to the, the process itself. But like I said, giving them an opportunity and as much equity within this space to speak up when they didn't feel something was aligned with with how they instinctively wanted the output to be shaped. But I think um, part of that though was it was messy and the client wanted something that was clean and, and design thinking and they had this like shiny output. And I, I always level set um, at the beginning with the client that a lot of processes are meant to sell you an idea by surprising and wowing you. Right, so you, you get the insights, you go away, tinker on it, you come back, you put a beautiful quote in the inside, and it's like, whoa, we didn't see that coming. And so usually I tell them you're not gonna be surprised and wild because you're going to be embedded in the entire process. And by the end of it, there shouldn't be anything that has surprised you because when we hit a brick wall and there's something not right, you're gonna know because you are there with us and there's that level of transparency and vulnerability that we try to have of our clients, which just means that we're very selective of which clients we work with because not everyone um, is down for, for that, for that level of transparency and for that level of inclusivity and that level of promising them a process that's gonna yield an output and then allowing them to see the messiness of that process. And so there, there have been times that we didn't finish an engagement because the client just like after a while was like, no, well, you know, I'm not really comfortable with this. And, you know, there's only so much, um, I guess, stewarding that can be done if a client is used to uh, another process. And so, like I said, we always try to just ensure and just off the bat, like even in first conversations, we only talk about our values. And there's been times where clients are like, Yo, forget your, like, okay, cool, we get your values, but what are your actual services? And then we're like, okay, awesome. 
you just hit off the red flag that we usually don't foresee. And then the follow-up email is like, thank you very much. Great conversation. We don't feel like this opportunity is the right one for us. And we tend to just move on from there. Thanks so much. Are there, are there any other um, panelists that want to add? Um, it, I, I'll just, I'll very quickly add, uh, I mean, we have, uh, we're engaged in, in quite a few of these because it's what, what we generally do, but one um, that, and, and I really like your, your point, New, regarding the expectations that people have. Um, one, I, I think it, it often gets even more painful if it's a long-term engagement, because what happens is not only do you see the issues that arise with the design itself, but um, the better you're doing, the more flaws and cracks within the structures of the organizations that start to appear. And so um, it, it takes a lot of courage on the part of the people that we work with or the organizations or entities that we work with to engage in this. But um, if you get over that hump and you, you uh, it, it becomes a much more fundamental foundational change within the organization that often happens when it's successful. Um, one example of one that we're working on at the moment is um, with platforms and platform cooperatives um, specifically addressing, uh, and these are largely care cooperatives um, all around the world. And so it, it's been such an amazing privilege to um, bring together a very, very different, diverse perspectives. Um, we're working in India with the Self-Employed Women's Association in India. We're working with care uh, uh, groups that are in Chicago and in various other places. So it's the the the, the part about <laughs> the sort of iterative process that I didn't talk about is just also creating this network. Once you have the, the once you have a, a process, a structure, a system of respect for each other's perspectives, it also prepares you better for um, creating a larger network, inviting more people. It does it does become this sort of spreading, um, emerging virtuous tornado. Thank you. Well, I love the fact that we ended on the term virtuous tornado because I think it's something that will stay with all of us. And unfortunately, uh, uh, we've run out of time for the panel and I, I could engage in this dialogue for a lot longer, but it's also um, at least in Toronto after eight. And uh, if you haven't had dinner yet, you're probably itching too. And so um, let's turn back uh, to Deborah to, uh, to wrap this up. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you for your um, time and engagement, uh, Nicole, the panelists, as well as the um, audience tonight. Um, programs like these are made possible through your support. Please consider joining Design TO's member community. We have new benefits, tiers, and year-round programming available starting later this fall. Look out for announcements soon, um, and more information is available at designto.org slash member. A recording of this event will be available on our YouTube channel in a couple of days with closed captioning. Attendees will be emailed um, with a link. And as we build our online programming, please um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, and look out for um, our inclusive design symposium um, in January. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>